Okay, let's try that again. So today we're going to talk about the data decision support system. Uh, better data for better decisions. Um, so those of you who use uh, data from roads, they may, may be aware that at certain times of year it actually runs a lot slower than on ordinarily. So on this chart here, you can see, let's see if I can get this to work. You can see the red line is actually the CPU usage from the roads in production. And the blue line here is actually the number of activities. So you can see around the start of September every year, there's a massive surge of usage. And that's from two places. One is from the students, and then one is from the administrators at the university who are trying to, while the students are logging in, they're also trying to get data out the back um, of the um, database at the same time. And that slows down the performance for both the students and both and the administrators. So Frank and I, mostly Frank, come up with a solution, uh, which is to copy uh, the data real time into the cloud. So whereas at the moment, rows of data um, updates into sort of different databases maybe once a night, it will now update uh, once every, all the time. There'll be a one second delay, I believe, something like that. <laughs> so you'll have access to real time data. It'll be up 99.7% of the time, and it will be copied into the cloud using a software called Attunity Replicate. The second part of this, which I hope you're interested in, is that the data will be completely secure in the cloud. It'll be stored in Microsoft's uh, data center on Front Street. So it'll be staying within Canada, and its backup site is in uh, Quebec City. Uh, and uh, you need to go on uh, or we might have to end the, um, um, the remote because people are making a lot of noise. So the data uh, is secure. It's encrypted. When it's transferred from the Microsoft Center to the campus, it's encrypted. And it's also encrypted at rest when it's stored in the Microsoft Center, which I think currently Rosie Production is not encrypted at rest. Yeah. So that's a big improvement in the encryption. And then the last piece is, when I refer back to the original problem, I mentioned that the system tends to run slower the more people are using it. So when you need it the most is when it's harder to use. Because it's in the cloud, we will be able to scale up the, the, the processing capacity as and when we need it. So if everyone in this room decides to access it at the same time, it will simply allow more and more CPU to be put behind the queries. So actually when it's busier, it'll run faster, whereas right now, when it's busier, it'll run slower. So the three main groups who benefit, of course, number one is the students. So because all the administrators will no longer be using the system, they have a more seamless experience as they won't be sharing resources with the administrators. The second group is Rocket Shuttle users. Anyone here use Rocket Shuttle? Show of hands. So no one, okay. <laughs> we'll skip the Rocket Shuttle, Shuttle section of the presentation. So you guys will be able to get your queries to run faster. And you'll also get access to more fresh data because it'll be updated more regularly. And also, you will get access to a ton of extra tools that you can use to analyze data that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. And then the third piece is, of course, divisional leadership. They will have access to higher quality data as it will be more, uh, concur more current. And they'll also have access to a system which has a higher level of data security. Uh, there's three additional benefits that we wanted to talk about. Uh, the first one, divisional data stores, we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail in the presentation. So I'm going to skip over that for the moment. But the other two is this ROSI data forms part of what we're calling the NGSIS data lake. So we're moving ROSI data in real time into this data lake first. But over time, we'll add more and more data from different systems. And rocket shuttle users and users from other um, systems, for example, SPSS, will be able to access that data in a real time fashion as well. And then the third component is that we're also going to start to um, enable uh, data science virtual machines to connect to this data store. So you'll be able to access analytical tools like Tableau, the statistical analysis packages like R, or if any of you is um, using Python or different machine learning platforms, they're all included and there's no charge for them. They're all free. So you simply turn on a virtual machine, you assign how much RAM you want, how much processing power, and you do all of your analysis, and it connects direct to the data lake. And when you're finished, you can just close the thing off. Now I'm going to turn over to Frank, I believe. Oh, sorry. So I think later on we're going to talk about the divisional data stores in a little bit more detail. But now I'll give it over to Frank. Okay. I don't know. I was just holding it. Uh, oh. Okay. Let's get the technical diagram up there. Uh, okay. So uh, how many people were at the first session that we took? Um, Bit of a technical diagram, but uh, basically what we're trying to depict here are the communication channels uh, between the major. Uh, 
somebody needs to put their phone on mute again. Uh, thanks. The, the, the secret key uh, really is this connection between these two brothers. Uh, That's what they refer to as a site-to-site -site VPN. Okay. That sounds like a cookie monster. <laughs> Um, and Sorry, can everyone on the line go on mute, please? Um, so what we've done here is established a secure connection between the university networks uh, and the Microsoft networks. Um, <laughs> So to, to start with, on the left-hand side there, I've got an a, a icon depicting the divisional administrators and report consumers. So if you're using a report being generated by uh, Tableau today, we, the plan is to hook Tableau up through this site-to-site -site VPN uh, and connect to that database. Um, the, when you report this, it says you would um, There are also uh, DBAs who typically manage the data in these databases. Um, they would have access through to Azure to that database. Now, to be clear, uh, Microsoft is actually managing that platform for us. So you don't, don't think that when you're establishing databases here that you need to hire DBAs. You, we need people that are data savvy, but uh, Microsoft actually runs that platform. They apply the patches, they do the backups, they uh, do the health checks. Um, so that part of it's all taken care of. All we have to worry about is the data. There, uh, this, this icon at the top left hand side, existing divisional data sources. If you've got data in your division at the moment that you would like to um, query along with ROSI data, or you just want to, um, you'd be able to connect that up to this database. So if um, there was a show of hands of Rocket Shuttle users, um, you think of this box, yeah, that I'm pointing to as Rocket Shuttle. You connect to Rocket Shuttle like you do today, or actually with that. Um, and then it would be connected to the secret database. So in terms of rocket shuttle, your behavior doesn't really change. It's as you do today with on the ROSI database, you would do tomorrow in the secret. Um, Rob mentioned earlier that we because we've got the two copies of ROSI now, um, the workload can be separated. So the administrative reporting workloads, batch processes, and so on, can be directed over here rather than to the production ROSI data. That means that when you know we have registration days or you know the first couple of weeks of September when it's January in the system, all the reporting won't be impacted. You'd, you've basically got a separate system altogether. So all in all, this is quite exciting. I think uh, <laughs> somebody mentioned to me that they've been waiting 20 years for this. <laughs> um, the other sort of side effect of this is that we've got a real-time, up-to-date copy of Rosie that is off-site. So there's kind of a disaster recovery benefit out of this as well. In the future, we also see new structured and unstructured data sources from across the institution being fed into the environment. Um, so, you know, it gives you the opportunity of, uh, instead of downloading ROSI data and analyzing it locally on, in your division, you would now be able to upload unique student data to this environment and analyze it alongside the ROSI data. You can do joins across the database. So that, I think, is going to be interesting to see how you can take advantage of that. Um, 
of course, these, these others, the other data, data factory replicator, that's an Azure resource that will help you uh, migrate data from your on-premise uh, resources into the Azure cloud. And then we've got the machine learning and the data uh, components that are going to come later. Um, Anything else? Okay. Added benefits. You want to say that? <laughs> I think this is just, uh, I'll just uh, go through a little bit more about what Frank said about the divisional data stores, and then Brenda's going to do a um, quick demo to show you some of the uh, portal. Um, so, as I mentioned, next slide. Uh, so, for the, as Frank mentioned, for the divisional data stores, one of the advantages is going to be the ability to do a cross join so you'll have what's access to a called a SQL managed instance. So right now I'd say a lot of you are taking data out of Rosie, you're then manipulating the data and putting it into your own database in order to join it to your data. Does that sound familiar to a lot of people? Yeah. So, uh, what will happen now is you can actually keep your data in its current format and you can put it side by side with the institutional, the Rosie data, and you can do a cross database join on both data sets without having to copy one into the other environment. They can just be joined across. Uh, so that's one advantage. Uh, the second one, I think, is um, next slide. Um, database as a service. So if you do have ooh, uh, any Jefferson's airplane fans here, uh, if you do have a database that you manage and you transfer it into the system, not only can you connect it to all of this other data without having to do complex changes of the data, you'll also no longer have to do the same level of maintenance for the database. So Microsoft, it won't be Frank and I, it'll be Microsoft, will handle things like upgrades and maintenance. So sort of the back-end work that you're doing to maintain that database will basically be gone, and you can free up your time to spend you know, doing other things with the data rather than just maintaining the database. Um, so I think some of the, I think Brenda's going to show later on, but some of the um, um, benefits are the added security and compliance. So it has reporting logs that shows you who accessed the database and when. So if anyone needs information about that, it'll be automatically available through a report. It also has AI that actually detects things, um, and I think Brenda's going to show that a little bit later on. And it also does all automatic tuning and scaling, scaling performance. So there's a lot of things that it'll do that'll save your time that you can use it for other activities. Um, then the third piece, just to go in a little bit more detail, is advanced security. I know this is a, a really um, um, a topic where there's a lot of focus at the moment. moment. Um, as I said, it'll be in Microsoft's front street center. It'll have uh, encrypted at rest, encrypted at motion. It will also have the ability to have uh, row level um, security. It has advanced threat detection, which I think Brenda, again, I'm just going to roll into Brenda. You're going to do a little demo of that later on. Is there anything else for this I've missed before I move on? And it also has authorization, so you can control who has access to your databases in a very user-friendly and seamless manner. And then the last step is, of course, backups. You can schedule your backups, and basically your backups will be run automatically. Um, the backups are encrypted, and then every 90 days, Microsoft automatically um, updates the encryption key for you. So even if you've got a backup that's five years old, you don't have to worry that the encryption key is out of date. That's all taken care of. So all of this stuff happens in the background, and you get access to this kind of more modern toolkit without having to worry about all the extra maintenance that's going to um, cost you to, to get access. So I think the next slide is just really kind of about kind of the logistics of how this is going to happen. So I think quite a few people um, put up their hand and they said they're a Rocket Shell user. Um, and for, as Frank mentioned, you simply are going to change uh, the, access, ooh, the access point on your Rocket Shell to a URL address. And that's the only change you're going to have to make, with the minor exception that some of your uh, SQL code is going to have to change. So currently, the SQL code you write is uh, for IBM DBT. You'll have to modify that to work for uh, SQL. So Brenda is going to show you again uh, a demo of how to convert that code. But basically, it involves copying and pasting. And if I'm able to convert the code, I think everyone can convert the code. And then the last thing is, I know there's some people out there who access the data using other tools other than Rocket Shuttle. I think, David, you use SPSS. Yeah. Is there anyone here who uses any other, any other tools other than Rocket Shuttle to access Rosie data? Uh, anyone got anything else? Well, web services? So what we're going to do is, um, as people say, hey, what about this? I use it a slightly different way. We have, uh, if you go to the next slide, we're going to basically set up um, a single point of contact email address. 
uh, easy shared services at utoronto.ca where you can email us and say, hey, I want to get access to this. Or if there's any questions about how to connect from SPSS or a tool we haven't considered, you can send your query there and we'll basically write an instruction guide for how to connect with that tool. And we'll publish it onto our website, which is the NGSIS website, which is, for those of you who can't, it is sis.utoronto.ca forward slash NGSIS. So there'll be instructional guides there for different tools for how to connect. And if you do try to connect and you're having difficulties, you can contact us and we will obviously help you out. And then the third piece is um, we will have workshops set up in 215 Euron where if anyone does have, you know, I've tried to do this and it doesn't work, you can come along and there will be people there who will sit down with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis to go through your code and, and figure out where the problem is. Uh, Frank, do we want to talk about who's going to be there? Um, so uh, the group of experts that we've corralled um, include, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with these names at all, but uh, Laurel Williams, Bruce Zhu, uh, Ken Sang. Um, there, there are a couple of others that we'll bring in as needed. Um, but this is going to be the team that currently support a whole bunch of student-related uh, applications and connectivity that happens currently between the divisions and Rosie. Um, so they're, they're going to be trained up and uh, be able to help with. So I think the next slide, if we can go to that, is demo. So first we're going to show you how to do the SQL conversion. And we're going to have questions, time for questions at the end as well. So, um, so I imagine you have your SQL. Oh, we can't see the screen. Drag it over here. Bear with us. Can I take over here? Uh, just a moment. Technical difficulties. So you have your SQL code that you're running Rocket Shuttle right now. It looks something like this on the left-hand side. You can see this is a website address. I can't you go to the top left here. You say, I'm using IBM DB2 code. You copy it in. Over in the top right, you say, I want to choose uh, Microsoft SQL. And then it will convert the SQL from one format to the other. Uh, for those of you who are um, not into SQL, I know it's a very exciting topic. One of the things you'll notice the biggest change is about date formats. So it's not um, a massive change, it's just basically some minor syntax. But the one thing you'll notice is how it stores dates looks, looks relatively different. So this is a free tool. There's other ones if you don't want to use this one. So literally if you have you know, 10 queries, you just copy each one in, you convert it, you save it, and let's say you run the 10 queries and of the, the 10 queries you, you, you run one of them, an error comes out, you're like, what the heck is this? You just take it, you just email it to the email address we created, and someone on the team will, will debug it for you and come back to you with a solution. And if that doesn't work, you can come meet us one-on-one -on -one in one of these workshops. So we're anticipating very little uh, issues with this. But we want to uh, make sure that we give you all the support that we can uh, during the transition. So the second thing, and so does anyone have any questions just specifically about the SQL converter? No? Big SQL fans here? That was like the little drum. Uh, so if you go to the, so the second piece that we're going to uh, talk about, or Brenda's going to talk about, is the Azure Pro Portal. So this is basically a website that you would go to to manage a, um, your database. So if Brenda's going to pop it open. Uh, so Brenda's going to take it over, but basically you can see along the left-hand side, there's all these different resource icons. So not everyone will have access to the full list here. Brenda obviously is a, an admin, so she can see quite a lot. But she's now just going to walk you through different examples of the different tools that this Azure database service will come with. We're not going to go through everything. We'll be here all day, but Brenda has picked some that she thinks will be interesting to you. So as you all know, I'm a big IBM fan, but I'm fast becoming a very, very big Microsoft fan. This database has really made a difference. Um, what I want to show you is uh, on the left, you see all the different um, resources if I went to all resources over here. That's everything. This is our test site, just to be clear. This is the test site. It's not production. This is not what you'd connect to. 
But um, you land up with a whole long list of um, resources. You want to look at your databases. Uh, this is the one we using that we've created to play with. And um, you get a beautiful um, overview. Let me just close that so we have more viewing room. There you go. Let's go back down. Now, this is all just the press of a button. There is nothing that I've gone in and written a script to see or um, anything special. This is out of the box. This is what's delivered. Um, the backups, uh, Rob mentioned that you're going to schedule your backups. That's, oh, this is a little annoying. Yeah. I'm used, yeah. Now it's getting confused with the icons on the side. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, you have to use it. Hold on, let me just. I think we'll do that. That's better. Thank you. Okay, so now let's just make. <laughs> okay, I don't know why I can't get up there now. Anyway, the missing scroll bar. Anyway, I wanted to show you that we uh, actually. I'm going to go back if you don't mind. Start again. I think we can. I really do want to show you. The backups are automatic. There is nothing you have to do to do a backup. The backups run in the background. They automatic. When you create a database, the first thing it's going to do is run a backup. Um, you can do a point in time restore, and at a glance, you can see your oldest restore point. So whatever the overarching restore retention period is been set to. That's what will be reflected here. The other thing that is um, of interest is at a glance on this uh, screen, you can see your automatic threat detection, which is automatically enabled. It's been set up to include that. So if you look at this, you can see there's been one alert for this database. You can also see your data storage. Obviously, it's very little, and you can see the resource utilization which, you know, obviously is very low, but nevertheless, um, if I went to show you a few more days, you'd see a little more. The other thing that uh, I really do like is the connection strings are just at the push of a button. There's your connection strings all delivered to you, depending on how you want to access the database. You, you'll be given the client that you need for the ODBC driver. Uh, as you can see, I download it and make it available. So that's all pretty um, seamless. There's, uh, I haven't had any issues working with that. The threat detection is, uh, from a security point of view, I could go at it this way. I could also go through the security bar on the left. It will show me my uh, security information. So the part that is interesting it does it will actually show you any columns that might contain data that should be masked so it'll actually run it does this automatically and it makes suggestions it thinks this should be masked whether you want to implement that or not is up to you there's nothing but it's nice to know that you might have a column that you need to think twice about in your in your database I haven't switched this on in, in this particular database. The threat detection, as you can see, you can see uh, we've had a, um, an issue. So I wanted to show you, I think this is a huge value add for us. You can see we've had a login from an unusual location. And um, if I go and look further, it tells me Exactly. Somebody logged on to your SQL Server from an unusual data center. That information, that happened on June the 22nd, and uh, it was from this IP, it was this ID, and this is the physical location that it, that it happened in. Now, this information was actually emailed to me automatically at the time that it happened. In fact, Andy and I are both administrators. We both got an email. And uh, we were quite, uh, well, what is this? Oh, my goodness. But anyway, it was fine. But nevertheless, it was really nice to know that uh, you get this uh, pretty seamlessly coming at you. The, the 
thing that I like is I didn't have to write a script to do this. It, it did it automatically with the one slider. So if detection's turned on, this is what you get for that. Um, the database, the production database, obviously will include that feature. So I haven't got my email alert up, but uh, it tells you from Azure. Um, I wanted to show you, this is the dynamic data masking that I was uh, talking about earlier. So if you look at this, you can see the column name, it's first name, last name, email. You can decide whether you want to add a mask or not. You can go in and do it yourself. Um, so you have options around that. Then there's the transparent data encryption, which you can see is on. Now, for the database that we're implementing in production, the encryption is at rest, in transit, and it actually is also encrypted during query processing. It only decrypts data that is returning to the user, which will be encrypted back over the VPN. So there really is very uh, small amounts of data that are not encrypted at any point um, during the process. So the next thing that I want to move to is uh, performance. The, the different dashboards that you've got um, from a performance point of view. So automatic tuning on these databases is is quite interesting. Um, you've got, as you can see, we've had two out of three automatic tuning um, recommendations actually enabled. So these databases will have automatic tuning in enabled. And uh, how it works is it's got a machine learning engine um, that as you run your queries, it's, it's learning and uh, makes recommendations. It'll apply the recommendation, but being a DBA, I'm, what are you doing there? And uh, I'm not so sure about that. I like to do it myself. I like to have more visibility. But in this case, it actually will apply it. And then if it carries on monitoring and if it decides that what it's decided to apply is actually not good, it reverses it and will try again. So um, from that point of view, it's a huge time saver because we all know Tuning a database takes a lot of time and effort. Um, so that is, for, 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 for me, that's a big value add. The uh, queries that you run, you have this query performance insight uh, that you can look at. And uh, you can see, you can look at it, CPU, data, log, uh, different parts to, I was doing a few queries this morning just to show you what it might look like. You have a few options. You can look at resource-consuming queries. You can look at long-running queries. It'll show you your breakdown, color-coded, and then it really couldn't be any easier. And um, I will, yes, his will be flashing red. <laughs> yes, you can detect your own. <laughs> so, uh, but also the automatic tuning will help um, in that case. I'm actually hoping not to see too many uh, that are really an issue, and, but we, need, we, we will monitor to check for scaling the actual resources up as a whole. Then if you click on the query, which is aggregated, uh, you can, what? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, you can see that it shows you the query text. If you have a, a really large query, it'll break it out here, yeah, and I have a few that you know will scroll down over many pages. And it breaks down the uh, resources that query is using. It also tells you when it was run um, and for how long. So obviously, on a busier database, which it will become, you will have a lot more to look at than I can show you today. That's. Uh, the query performance and details. Kind of, we've covered off the automatic advisor, the the bottom <laughs> intelligence. Somebody needs to mute their microphone there. And the. So from a query, you've got the dynamic data masking, you've got the built-in intelligence with the intelligence insights, and um, the uh, automatic tuning. So what I'm going to move to is the SQL Server uh, 
management studio, which I think a lot of you use today. Now, the reality is you don't create a database through the Azure portal. The portal I'm showing you is sort of an overview. You can, you can um, create the overarching databases. You do your resource monitoring through that. And I think that would be more an easy role. But as a DBA, you want to be able to create your tables. You want to be able to migrate your data. And uh, I've been using the um, Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, SQL Server Database. That's what it needs. And uh, you can do, so here's the Azure database, the same that you'd normally see. Here's your table, and you do your selection. The uh, response time is uh, very good, and I really have it at a very low tier. tier. So it's looking good. Here's your data back again. But otherwise, it's very much the same. You can add a user. You can do your SQL queries the same way you would today. These also, the uh, um, Microsoft uh, Data Migration Service that you can use as a tool to lift and shift your on-premise SQL Server database into the cloud. And the way I like to think about it is as an umbrella with databases of it. And you can create a database. You can take a SQL Server backup and actually restore it into this database, and then you can run that as your own. So I'm kind of thinking that might be a site database, and uh, the managed instance is a, sort of the umbrella over. But you would be running that database as if it's an on-premise database. The benefit is you don't have to do any upgrades. You don't have to apply any fix packs. Your backups are taken care of, and actually you've got three backups, so really um, you've got pretty good coverage. You don't have to worry about how old your infrastructure is. You don't have to worry about how old your servers are because you're always going to be up to date and it's really the operating system and hardware is not something you'd ever be concerned about, which um, I'm really enjoying when I'm using this. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a definitely a fan. Um, there are other ways to get different kinds of data. Not everyone's using a SQL Server database. There's copy, there's there, there are definitely diff different options of moving data into into the Azure cloud. And the whole idea is that you put your data there and you do the cross-database join to connect with the real-time ROSI database as opposed to pulling it all down and then doing your, your, um, your joins. Yeah, that's, that's it. So I want to have a question. How often will, will a new sh Sorry. Any other questions? I can't read what that says. I'm going to answer this. Uh, the, yeah, the question is um, how, 
how close to real time is the production copy of the ROSI data going to be? The Tunity software actually will replicate in near real time, so it's constantly updating. Uh, so the copy, the shadow, what somebody here has mentioned as a shadow database, is a is a near real time copy of the ROSI production database. Um, that should be available. It's basically, yeah. At night when the batch programs are running and there are millions of records being updated, there might be a lag of a minute or two. It's pretty much near instantaneous. As soon as something changes on the ROSI production database, Attunity picks it up and fires it off to. With the modern networks that we have today, um, the speed is becoming less and less of an issue. The uh, network bandwidth that we've got between our networks and Microsoft is currently rated, I think I was told, 1.4 gigabits per second. It isn't too shabby. Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, sure. sorry. Acorn uh, and the back end database is one gigabit per second. That performs sufficiently. Um, so this is 1.4. I'm just going to repeat Terry's question because people didn't hear. So um, uh, Terry's concerned about the speed on busy registration days. So will this database is data still be near real time on high registration days? And the answer is, is yes. Basically, uh, we're not expecting any significant lag time in the data replication. We can, if there is lag, we can throw money at the problem and it should go away to a certain extent. And I'll, I'll just press buttons. <laughs> Rob? Concerned. Um, we are establishing connections to the ROSI, the new ROSI Linux database, because we realize that you can't convert all your systems and queries over to uh, T-SQL and, and uh, Azure overnight. Um, so there will be a period of time that, that um, you'll have to be able to 
uh, switch things over and redirect your queries to this, uh, this new system. Um, at some point, though, we would like to sort of disconnect connections directly to the ROSI database so that the Azure copy is for reporting and analytics and uh, operational reports, and then uh, the on-premise copy, uh, the production database, is really just for transactions. It's for students and administrators for transactional load. Um, and that way we can tune each of those databases for their particular workloads. Um, the Azure one is, <laughs> uh, has the added advantage of being able to scale uh, in, in, in accordance with the, the types of queries that we want. So um, Rosie's got limited capacity <laughs> for that. Yeah, the Azure database will um, handle analytic queries as well as transactional queries, which is far more elastic than the existing databases. Oh, yep. John would have to stay with us as well. Yes. Yes. The reason I hesitate is that he can't. That's my question. Can I run that out? Yeah. So, right now, the replication is in the direction from the Rosie on the same database to the Rosie. Any applications that you can to the Azure database? If they do updates there, those updates won't travel back to the ROSI database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not fussy. <laughs> um, but the, the trick is to keep it read only for now. Yeah. Just to, uh, I'm just going to jump in there because as a division, it, the ROSI database in this managed instance is read-only and will always be read-only for obvious reasons. But if a divisional database, uh, so you've got database one being ROSI, the second database is a divisional database. Well, that's your database. You update that. It's not only read-only. You connect an application to that. That's fine because at the end of the day, if you want to lift and shift your database into the cloud, you've got to still be able to connect your applications. Otherwise, what's the point? You'd still need the other database. The whole idea is to make it easier for everyone. So if you do move your database there, yes, you can connect your applications and that's your database. You're responsible for the data and you handle your own authorization in the database. The nice thing is you don't have to worry about disaster recovery, backups, upgrades, fix backs, all that wonderful stuff that we all love to do. Any other questions? Anything on the... Um um, I can't see you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So the question was how to manage user access. Frank, you said you wanted to take that one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so this is managed uh, through uh, what's termed Azure AD. Um, so much like we've got Enterprise AD on premise at the moment, in Azure, they've got Azure AD, all of our uh, U2 IDs are automatically transferred to Azure AD. In Azure AD, you can manage the group memberships uh, of the, the various roles and, and, and groups that you want to, ac ac to access these, these data. Yeah. Right now, from uh, Easy's perspective, the uh, user management follows what we're doing for Rosie today. Um, so there are uh, forms, unfortunately, paper-based, that, that get filled out, um, although there is a PDF now. Um, and there's a process associated with that that gets acted upon by, by Easy staff. Um, and we just see this as... Uh, sort of an adjunct to uh, that provisioning. So if a user has access to particular data in ROSI today, they'd have that same access to the ROSI data in Azure. Um, for the divisional databases that get set up, they will have their own user administrator um, that would act on 
uh, Azure AD. So they're responsible for that. They are in the best position to know who should have access. Yep. So you very quickly mentioned the Right, right. Oh, okay. So there's a bit of a difference there, Dan. I mean, you you have it. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? System administrators for the subscription level and the provisioning of the resources. Um, but then after that, for the user administration, um, that that's a different layer altogether. So you can assign somebody that will have access rights to administering user groups in Azure AD. Um, we're, we're working uh, through this with uh, uh, ICEA at the moment. I mean, much like managing uh, groups today through Open LDAP and Grouper and that sort of thing, we want that same kind of capability in Azure AD. Microsoft offers tools, but it's, it's, it means we've got two sets of tools essentially for this. All the database data that you have in your database today is your data. We don't have any knowledge or vision into your data, and I don't see how or why that's changed. So you need a way of managing your own data in the same way you do today, only now it will be through uh, U2ID, basically, run by somebody in your division. Any other questions? We just have to read the question back. Right. So the, the question is, does the Attunity data replicator impose any load on the ROSI production database, um, particularly uh, during busy days? There is a slight increase in load. It's, it's kind of equivalent to a, a, a monitoring system. So it varies between 3 and 5%. Um, but uh, we've been assured by uh, Attunity, and based on the number of customers they have, I don't think this is going to be a major uh, consideration, particularly when you consider that we're shifting about 30 to 40% of the workload off. So at the end of the day, I think we're going to be ahead. <laughs> the thing is, it doesn't actually read the data. It's using the logs, choosing the logs to replicate the data. So there's no actual read against the table. Um, anyone have any other questions? Um, I'll let you know. No, so we're just going to, like I said, uh, we're going to get this up first. Uh, so it's actually available now. So I have one. Uh, <laughs> So, but we want to get the rocket shuttle users of course. Um, so I would imagine that at the end of the year, we'll decide how is it working for the rocket shuttle users, and then that's phase two. But uh, I was hoping you'd be part of the pilot group for the first one. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Anyone the, if not, I think the last thing to do is, we just wanted to thank um, Mike Wiseman's group, ICF, for all the help that they gave us with this today. I don't know if yeah. anyone here from I Jason, see you. Jason's okay. here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you, Jason. Key to making this happen. Um, I think Sue is up there. I see Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>